it'll all work out fine. And if it doesn't, Kat Daly is going to text me and let me know the sound isn't working. But, um, and if you all could just mute yourselves uh, and then um, I will uh, have this video play for us. So give me one second here. Everyone, um, it's my pleasure to welcome Jackie Pippin to join us tonight. She's a chaplain in the Air Force, so uh, she's going to speak about her journey and some of her experiences with location. And um, it's good to be with you, Jackie. Thanks for joining us. Um, it's great to be here. Yeah, can you tell us where you're joining us from? Is that allowed? Yeah. Uh, okay, I'm cool. Uh, I'm currently stationed at Spangdalem Air Base. Um, it's on the eastern side of Germany on the border of Luxembourg. Um, so I'm at my house here in Germany. That's awesome. Cool. And uh, Jackie, we've known each other, I think, this over this past year. So um, you were coming in through officer training school, and it sounds like the officer trainees do some type of service project, and you're kind of reaching out to see. Because um, we have a mutual friend, Worth Stewart, who um, is a friend of St. John's and was a uh, youth minister here. And so... Um, we had that connection and so that's how we got to know you and um, you've been really helpful as I've been pursuing uh, my call vocation to the Air Force Chaplaincy so thanks for all that. Um, so Jackie you're an Air Force Chaplain now and we'll kind of get into some of your um, life and your journey there but when at the beginning of this just kind of define terms and what they mean to you um, when you hear the word vocation, what does that mean to you? Um, and what do you think of when you hear that word? You know, I, I think the word vocation really speaks to um, like what, you, what your soul is calling you to do. Um, and, and so I've had a, a lot of jobs in my life um, from Ben and Jerry's to Target to working at a debit card company. Um, but when I think of the things that my soul was calling me to do, you know, in undergrad when I worked as a campus minister or a youth group, but also like those volunteer opportunities that really fed my soul. Um, part of what like really introduced the thought of vocation and calling into my heart was um, in high school when I volunteered with our diocesan youth council. Um, and it was a monthly meeting where we planned events and, and fun stuff for youth in the Diocese of San Diego. And it was, it was the, one of the first times that I really felt that connection from what I was doing to my soul, to what I wanted out of the universe. Um, and and that's, that, that is what I think the root of vocation is. Where, where does the mix of the work that we can do match with our soul and what God is calling us to do. That's awesome. Cool. Um, and what do you think about this as far as vocation? I think some people, when I hear them talk about it, um, it's more of a singular thing and other people think of like multiple things. What do you think about vocations um, and how many you have? I, I think I definitely have to be on the, on the multiple spectrum, um, you know, because I think there are also I think your vocation can really relate to that time in your life. And um, when I was in undergrad, being a youth minister was really what I felt called and pulled to do during that time. Um, and when I started out my journey as a priest, I didn't think that I was called to military chaplaincy. Um, but now that I'm in it, you know, I really feel that sense of my vocation, my vocation here and now. Um, so I think there's also that. I think I think that you can have more than one, and, and I think it changes. I I do think that it changes as time goes on, and that and that's what I kind of love in the diocese of San Diego. Um, you know, they have always been open and willing to go through that process with me of where where is God active in our life, and and how do we acknowledge those changes and those things that we are called to do at different times. Yeah, yeah, neat. I think I'm in the multiple vocation camp too, and um, it definitely seems like an evolution of that and kind of an unfolding. I, I think 
it's definitely um, even if you have a sense of where your gifts and how they might uh, match up with like work in the world that that's an evolving thing too it's not a static thing and um, I think that's helpful because sometimes there's there can be a misconception of what's that one thing I'm supposed to do and it has to be exactly how I'm expecting it or um, it seems like what I'm hearing from you too is like a lot more play in the system yeah definitely I think there's been there are a lot of ways in which I thought my life would play out. And some of those have been true. Um, you know, marrying my husband, you know, I joked about that in our high school newsletter. Um, and, and here we are, but um, there are a lot of ways, especially job wise that um, I have been led into different things. And also, um, you know, in ways that outside of the uniform things that i like to do in my in my spare time that i do love and gratify my soul wow okay so maybe we'll just kind of talk about your journey in your life and kind of the different vocations you've uh, inhabited um but before we do what are some things that have helped you kind of discern and we use that d word sometimes um uh your vocation like what have been some helpful things that have helped you clarify what those different steps along the way might be? Um, I think I was very lucky in the, in the Diocese of San Diego that they encouraged me to get a spiritual director early on. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so I had that practice even before I went to seminary. And, um, you know, it's, it's kind of like if, if you don't know, like a, like a therapist for your soul. And um, that that was really helpful to me in, in exploring the ways in which God is ever present in our lives. And I think that is something that has really um, also given me the opportunity to pause and take time and, re and reflect on those things and reflect on those changes. Uh, but also I think um, my husband uh, being open to discern together, discern, um, you know, our marriage, discern what we are both called to do in the military um, and discern, he, he was such a huge part of discerning me joining the Air Force and what does that look like for our family and what does that look like for the future of our family and how do, how do we do it, you know? And I think he's been, a, he's been a huge factor in that discernment and him being open to that but ultimately, I also love to read. Um, so reading things, uh, whether they're other people discerning or other people's journeys, and um, that has been something that has really helped me to look at look at other people's lives and see see what's similar, what's different, and where um, where there's more opportunity for me to grow. That's awesome. Um, do you have any ones that you recommend or ones that have been especially meaningful to you about someone's life or experience or something where that's played out that you might? I, I actually read um, Searching for Sunday by Rachel oh, yeah. um, right after I had gone to Japan and I didn't have a church home and, and not because um, you know, we moved to a different country and, and there, there was only one Anglican church there and they spoke Japanese and, and they welcomed us in and it was, it was a wonderful place, but there was also um, a big piece that was missing for me of, of what I expected on Sundays, which was to worship in English, which is my language. And uh, so there were, while it was an incredible community and I loved them dearly, there was also this aspect of mourning and grieving what I had come to love about Sundays. And her journey is very different than that, um, you know, and it's kind of her fall away from the church, but I think that uh, her finding those things again in, in everyday life was, I think, really important for me to read and see um, as I embarked on that journey too. Wow, yeah, that's a great book. I've happened to read that too. And um, I grew up, uh, uh, in evangelical churches and um, so and I found my way to the Episcopal Church so seeing her journey and I think in that book she structures her journey around the seven sacraments so just beautiful reflections on it and just her life of faith um, yeah that's a great book I um, actually got to meet her during seminary real quick uh, during a dinner 
for um, during our CPE or clinical pastoral education. There's like a little dinner celebrating the association in Tennessee. And she was kind of getting popular and big. And she said, I love the work of chaplains. And yeah, I'll come speak and hang out with you guys. And it was just kind of this really unexpected thing. And um, I totally uh, was just happy to meet her. And I got got a selfie and um, read her book. Uh, great, great life and legacy she's left with us. Um, that's awesome. Okay, Searching for Sunday. So that might be helpful for someone just to read um, as they're thinking about their own life and uh, vocation. Um, okay, so tell us a little bit about your background and kind of the sketch of your journey and where you're at now and the different vocations you've kind of lived in. <laughs> uh, well, I was mostly raised in Southern California, um, Palm Springs area for anyone that knows Southern California. And that is in the Diocese of San Diego. And so I, I did have a really wonderful opportunity to have great youth ministers that formed me and loved me and gave me a place to exist and figure out my relationship with God. And I think that, that was huge for me. I fell in love with the Episcopal Church there. Um, I went to my first general convention shortly after graduating high school and I, I just knew that I wanted to be a part of the church. And so for a long time, I, I thought that that was going to be in um, being a school teacher because, you know, when you, when you teach, you have your Sundays free and you have your evenings free so you can go to church activities. Um, and so it made perfect sense to me. I moved down to San Diego to start going to San Diego State um, for English so that I could teach my little heart out. And during that time, I started to work as a youth minister. I also worked weird odd and end jobs at a pizza place, at an ice cream place, at a credit card company. Um, but when I was working part-time as a youth minister at two different churches, I fell in love with the aspect of um, being present with youth and walking their journey with them. Like having this opportunity to step into that having this opportunity to, um, you know, like reflect back to them, you know, what they are saying, what they're experiencing, what they're questioning, um, to hold those things. And that, that was when I began to discern a call to ministry because I, what I really loved was um, that opportunity to step in, that opportunity to be present um, to join them where they were. And so that was when I started the formal discernment process in the diocese. Wow. And um, it, it, it was a fun journey. I love the discernment process. It's not easy. Um, you know, you, you get a lot of questions. There are lots of committees. There's lots of um, things that you need to write. But I loved that that diocese um, just loved me through all of it. And I really felt that that grew my relationship with the church much stronger. Um, during that time, I was dating a man in the Air Force. He was attending the Air Force Academy. And um, I, I wasn't sure how, how that would work out. You know, I, I remember meeting with my bishop and telling him, you know, I, I want to go to seminary. Um, I think, I think that there's something there for me. Um, but, you know, you usually have to co come back to your diocese and, and serve there. And, and I was like, I don't, it's very serious with this, with this man. He's in the Air Force. There are no Air Force bases here. Like, what is, what does that mean? Does that mean that I can't go through this process? And I was lucky to have an incredibly supportive bishop, Bishop Mathis, um, who just said, there's a lot of what ifs in this scenario. And I think we should continue on and see where God leads us and see where God leads your relationship and we will work it out. And I think that was just such a huge moment for me in realizing that like there was a plan. God had a plan. God had a plan for both our relationship um, you know, as a couple and also like my relationship with God, my faith and, and my vocation. Uh, and so that was, that was an exciting time. 
I went off to Virginia Theological Seminary uh, in Alexandria, Virginia, and it was, a, a, I chose it because it was slightly outside of my comfort zone. I'm, I'm from Southern California. I love no winter. I'm a firm believer in flip-flops every day. Uh, you know, it was, in California, there are no old buildings. You don't have old buildings. They're all torn yeah. down. And so moving, moving to Virginia, I just, I couldn't believe how old everything was. I couldn't believe how much brick there existed in the world. <laughs> I couldn't believe that people still wore bow ties. Um, but it was such a magical place. I loved my time during seminary. I, I made great friends. Um, there were some really high highs and some low lows and a lot of God mixed into all of it. Um, and so that was an exciting time when I just felt so enveloped by that community um, and loved and nurtured and fed. And uh, after seminary, I, I had a crazy summer. My, my bishop had warned me about a lot of major life changes happening at once, but it just, it just worked out that way. So I graduated from seminary. Um, my husband graduated from his training course. I was ordained a deacon we got married and we moved to Japan. Wow. And so we uh, had a whirlwind summer. <laughs> yeah. You fit them yeah. in in that one yeah. week. Exactly. We, we thought that it would be the, the craziest summer that we ever had, but we tried to rival it last summer with our, with our big move too. Um, and we moved to Japan and it was, um, it was such an incredible time in our marriage. You know, we, we had these three years um, in a very small house in a wonderful base community in Northern Japan where we um, figured out what our relationship looked like, figured out our rhythm. We started attending an Anglican church that only spoke Japanese south of us. Wow. And um, the first time we, we went in there, my husband leaned over at one point. He's like, I, I think we're at the creed. <laughs> I think we are too. <laughs> and um, so it was a really magical time, but it was also uh, the first time that I didn't work full time. And that was, uh, it was hard. That was very hard for me. I have always felt worth in my work. Um, you know, whether, whether it was a pizza job or, or, or an administrative assistant, I've, I have always enjoyed working. Um, and even while I went to school, I, I always worked. Um, and so that was something to go from working so hard for so long to not. Um, and so I really tried to find my place. Uh, and I, so I began teaching English um, at a college about, uh, about an hour south of us. And so I started to do these odds and end thing things. And eventually my, my husband's commander um, asked if I would be a key spouse. And a key spouse is um, a spouse that is appointed by the squadron commander. And your, your job is to be a link between the spouses and the squadron commander. So if something's going wrong, you can let the squadron commander know, or you can get the squadron commander involved. You can, um, you're, you take care of, of those spouses, of those families. Um, when, when the military members are gone, you know, you can, you can be that go-between to keep consistency, to keep that love, to keep that community. Um, and you are, you're a community builder. And so I, I took on this role and I loved it. I loved it so much. It was, and it was such a fun thing to do. I started writing birthday cards to every single person in our squadron. Wow. And, you know, we would have all of these celebrations and dinners at my house. And it was really a time when I realized that there was a role for me in the Air Force. Um, and for a long time, I had been very convinced that there, that there wasn't, that I wouldn't fit into the Air Force. Um, I'm not your typical Air Force person. And so that, that was something that I, I had never grappled with because I was just sure of it. 
And so once I became a key spouse and I, and I fell in love doing these things and I realized that I could do those things in my vocation as a priest in the Air Force, I was worried. I was worried because I was so sure about so many things. And um, my husband and I had, had been on vacation and we were about to go visit our parents and I was like, we, we need to talk. And he's just like, what? And I was like, I just, I think maybe I should join the Air Force. And he was just like, what? <laughs> and because we, we, you know, we had, we had always joked about it and we had always been very sure that the Air Force wasn't for me. It was his thing. And I was a great key spouse and I was great at all these other things, but that, no, it wasn't for me. And so it was really this wonderful, we spent about six months. I mean, we really discerned right up until I signed the piece of paper, but you know, we, we had this wonderful time of joint discernment and it was, and we were still, we had been married two and a half years at this point, And it was a really magical time in our marriage too, um, to really plan out wh what do we want? What do we want for ourselves? Um, what do we want to see out of each other? What do we want in our marriage? And, um, it, it was it was such a lovely time of discerning that together and we made lots of pros and cons list we we had a whiteboard that we would erase every week and write a new pro and con list um but it was such a fun time of really taking that intentional planning time together uh and i do i loved it so much wow and, so, and, and yeah your husband i mean he's really air force guy he went to the air yeah. force academy and has a specialized yeah. job in the air force so so there was an element of the unexpected you weren't expecting that to develop or obviously yeah. it was something you really grappled with and um came to so that, that's interesting i think just a key insight in your journey is that um it was something that arose in an unexpected way and then you kind of reckoned with it and said okay i think I can do this, you know, or I think this is me. I exactly. think that's helpful. And I think my husband, um, Scott is his name. My husband, uh, he is so good at being an Air Force officer. You know, he just, he fits the mold. Um, he, he went to the Air Force Academy. He had already been an officer for six years by the time we started discerning. Um, and so it was, it was a really interesting journey because I'm the, I'm the quirky one in our relationship. You know, I'm the extrovert. I'm the one that has no military. This space does not have a military. <laughs> um, and so it was, it was such an interesting thing. It was such an interesting thing to embark on together. And especially from his perspective. Um, and yeah, so it was, it was very interesting. Wow. That's awesome. Um, that, that's, that's really cool. Uh, when you're talking about the discernment process, um, I think we do a really good job in the Episcopal church of having that community of people who, um, will come alongside you and go through this formal process to see where your giftings and callings might line up with uh, ordained ministry or uh, lay ministry. Um, it's more formal, I feel like for the, well, definitely more formal for ordained leaders. Um, I think church-wide it's more skewed that way. But fundamentally, I think it comes down a lot to community for lay or ordained people. If you have people in your life that you can share your life with and your passions and what you feel drawn to and kind of figure that out or discern it together. Um, and I think that's a real valuable key. And um, when I went and saw the Bishop, when I was starting the discernment process, um, and like you said, it's a really formal process. Um, there's a lot of committee meetings and right. you write and share your spiritual autobiography with a bunch of people many times over. And uh, you're always kind of in a, I described it, you're like an alien on the table, the dissection table, you know, they're yep. kind of poking and prodding. Um, 
but so it was scary. We went, me and my priest, Allison, and uh, my wife, Lauren, we drove down to the diocese headquarters in Birmingham to see the bishop. And I was so intimidated. And, uh, but he, his, our bishop was great, uh, like yours. Um, Keith Sloan, who's retiring this year, he said, um, Jamie, kind of opened the meeting. He said, I'm going to ask you a lot of unfair questions about God and your journey. And when you get back home, you'll be like, shoot, I should have said this, or I should have said that. Um, he said, sorry, it's just part of the gig. But he said, he kind of opened up and said, God works in mistakable ways. And he said, um, we have this whole community doing this discernment. And there's probably some people who should be ordained that the community says no, and that's a mistake, but we're trying our best. And there's some people we probably sent through who probably uh, we made a mistake on that. So I don't know something about that. There can be so much anxiety when we think about, am I doing the right thing or whatever? And he just kind of said, let's just do this process. And there was a piece about it that really helped me. And um, I, I think that's a big key when people are trying to figure out what they're supposed to do. It can be so heavy and a burden. And um, yeah. I don't know. And I see that kind of in your journey too, where you're just, I'm going to try this out. or I'm going to think about this and see what happens. Um, where does that come for, for uh, where does that come from for you? You seem pretty open and uh, willing to explore well, that. I think, um, I think an openness to it not happening um with is kind of has kind of been big in at least this air force part of the journey um i remember when i was ordained um and my the youth minister that i grew up with had had come up to me and he was like i am so excited that we are affirming what god knew long ago uh, in your ordination and i and i think that's really true i i think that and i think that's true of the aspect of yeah, it, it might not it might not work out timing wise as best as it could. And that that was the thing in our discernment. I like would it have better been better if I knew that I was called to this in seminary and joined earlier? What, how would that have changed um, this journey? And in the end, I think especially for, for this part of it, I um, you know, we, we had a lot of security. I enjoyed the volunteer work that I was doing as a key spouse. Um, my husband's job was secure. He owes a lot more time. Um, and so in that way, we had the security to really discern it and, and be open to it. Um, so when I showed up to my, I, I had a, so you have a discernment process with um, the Episcopal Church for federal ministries. Um, section. And then you also have uh, an Air Force chaplain interview with the Air Force. And I went into that thinking, well, I'm just going to be honest. And if I'm not a good fit for this, that my life will be easier. <laughs> <laughs> and so I did, they asked me um, one question. They asked me to describe myself in two words. And I was like, well, I, I'm a lot. And they were, they were like a lot of what? And I was like, everything, any, anything <laughs> you can imagine, I'm going to be a lot at it. So I just want you to know if you let me join this chaplain corps, like I'm going to be a lot. <laughs> like, oh, okay. That's kind of weird. Um, but I just, I, I was nervous. I am nervous for those things, but I also um, kind of wanted to like leave it all on the field. I wananted to be honest and see where that got me. <laughs> Yeah, it was wow. that's awesome. But it it worked out, and you're you're. It worked out, and I'm sure it worked out that I am a lot. <laughs> uh, Jackie, it's sometimes when you feel drawn to something, it doesn't meet people's expectations, or it can feel risky, or um, maybe you'll disappoint other people, or you know, just zig when people think you're going to zag. Right. But what's your advice to people who might feel called to a certain action or a way of life that might be disruptive in some ways to, or not meet the expectations of others. What, what would you say to them? I think, um, you know, it does really remind me of Sheryl Sandberg's book, Lean In. Um, mm. That book 
uh, opened my eyes for how to how to be a, a feminist. Um, but it also opened my eyes in how to how to be present when we're unsure. You know, whether that's imposter syndrome, whether that's um, feeling underqualified, whether that's being scared, um, the opportunity to lean into it um, is is so huge. I remember the moment, and and Jamie, you might experience this moment soon. But but when we pulled our car up, I had I had hitched a ride with someone else, and we pulled our car up to OTS, and people immediately started yelling at us to get out of the car and. So we get out of the car and we're being yelled at that we're not moving fast enough with all of our earthly luggage and possessions. And, and it's already hot because it's summer in Alabama. <laughs> and I felt, I felt my heart pounding in my ears. And, you know, there was this moment where I was like, what is happening? Like, am I going to make it? Yeah. And it, it was just kind of like, not like a moment of resignation, but a moment of like, well, like we're going to see, we're going to see if I'm going to make it and then we'll know what happens. Um, and so I think, especially in, in that scenario, you know, my, my husband had just given me a good pep talk of, you know, take it day by day. And when you can't take it day by day, take it hour by hour. And when you can't take it hour by hour, take it minute by minute. And when you can't take it minute by minute, just start counting the seconds and time is going to happen. Um, but I think that's really a testament to, yeah, like life is going to happen. Yeah. And so what do you want to do during it? And it was funny. I still, I got out and I graduated and I, and I showed up here at Spengal on my first base and I was worried to go to work. I was like, what? what am I going to do? What is that going to look like? What is it? What does it mean to even be a chaplain? Like I still didn't know. Um, and, and I'm still learning, but there was, and there continues to be this moment of showing up and leaning in and trusting that this is where I'm supposed to be. Yeah, and um, I haven't read Lean In yet, but that's the second book recommendation from this that I'm taking, Searching for Sunday and Lean In. Um, but the imposter syndrome, I think too, uh, for me as a priest, still like three years into it, I feel more confident, but there's still times where I'm like, ah, am I qualified to do this or who do I think I am? Um, and what's helpful is to have a community of people behind me who say, Jamie, we see these gifts in you and you want to do this. Um, I really like preaching, but I hate preaching at the same time. I, I joke around. I heard in elementary school from the D.A.R.E. police officer, uh, the drug resistance program we did part of school. He said, every time you smoke a cigarette, it takes seven minutes off your life. And my joke is that every time I write a sermon, it's seven minutes off my life because I'm like, I don't <laughs> want to screw this up and I want to say something important and not damaging. I want to be helpful and to represent the church and try to spread the good news. And um, so it, it, that's a big part of my job too, like public speaking. And I'm like, I don't feel like I'm the most engaging or great at it, but I'm trying my best and just being present, you know, and um, stepping into that and being a father or a husband. I mean, I feel those things. And it's just, I think part of what helps is knowing that everyone feels like that and we're just trying to make it work, you know. Um, and I love what you said. I'm here at OTS, I'll just see what happens. You know, if I can make it, I'm gonna learn and find out. Um, I think it's just really helpful thing of just trying to take it, like you said, day by day or even minute by minute or second by second if you have to. Um, okay, so tell us a little bit about what's, what's your life like as a chaplain? What are some things uh, that would su surprise people to know or just what does the average person not know about what your job is? And I know you might not have a typical day with uh, specific work you're doing, but what, what's kind of what your life is like now? Um, I think part of it is that I never know what's going to happen. And every day when, when I look at a Monday schedule and it looks very free, I'm like, oh no, it's going to be a Tuesday. <laughs> um, so as a, as a military chaplain, you have, um, a lot of free reign. 
uh, which is very cool. So I would say average week, average goal, probably a third of your time is spent visiting units. Um, so I'm assigned to the mission support group, um, which, is, which means a lot of things. But uh, under my care is about a thousand military members. Um, and they, ha they are in all different kinds of career fields. I have like our military police that we call security forces to civil engineering, to the people who um, take care of the bowling alley or feeding airmen on base. And my job in unit visitation is a couple of couple of things. Um, one, and, and my favorite part of it is that you are joining people where they work. They don't they don't have to darken the doors of the chapel for even a moment. You can show up to their workplace and and join them there. Um, and so that it is unit visitation is my is my favorite thing for that reason. But there are there there's so many facets to it. So um, if you have a unit that's struggling, um, you can you can go and help them with something. Um, I have a unit that's that has has had a couple issues. It's it's a pretty small unit, and their their morale has been down. And so I schedule time every other week to go and work with them for an hour and a half. And their job is something that I can do, uh, and so it so it's a way to be with them to acknowledge that. You will, you will go through this with them. You'll go through this journey with them. You will show up. Um, and then it's also a way that you can assess the morale of the base. Um, you know, you can, you can see what units are um, grinding too hard and you can see what units are doing well. You can highlight great, great leadership that's happening. And you can also, you know, make someone aware of maybe some leadership decisions that aren't helping morale. Um, and so it really is, you know, visitation is, is my favorite part of the job. And honestly, during COVID, it's been one of the hardest um, because we are limited to the group sizes that we have. And because of that, you know, visitation has been the most affected and I miss it because it is, it's just so fun to show up to a place and to have everyone be like, hey, chaplain, and you just join in on whatever journey they're embarking on. Um, and some of that's been fun. I've done a lot of cool stuff. I love to serve meals on the meal line because you just get to see all of the airmen. Um, you also get to help with a job that people don't love to do. Uh, and they're always surprised to see you there. You know, all of a sudden you're like, you know, do you want turkey or chicken? And like, <laughs> the chaplain's there. <laughs> Uh, that's fun or you're at the post office is my favorite place um and you know you're bringing people their mail like you're making them happy already and so you just like pop up behind the counter and you're like hey what do you need and you like go off to get them and so um unit visitation is my favorite so clearly i'm biased that is my favorite that's that's a third of my average week mm -hmm. Another third of it is, is counseling, is one-on-one -on -one meeting with airmen or, you know, marriage counseling. And so what that's about, in the military structure, your chain of command is always in the know about what's happening. I mean, you know, little things, they're not gonna be in the know, but um, your chaplain is the only person on the base that you can go to that has 100% confidentiality. And so that's a really unique thing in a chain of command system. It creates a safe place and it creates a place where they can, they can be free. They can really let it all out. And so um, probably a third of my time is either walk-in or scheduled counselings and people just come by and it can, it can be any, it can be the entire spectrum. And I think that is something that surprised me about, about this job. Um, I did know about, you know, suicides in the Air Force. I did know um, about sexual assaults in the Air Force, um, but I don't know if I recognized like the, the face that I would have to those, um, you know, how those people that come in, that come into my office. But because of that, this, the spectrum of counseling can be someone who is 
struggling if they want to live or not to someone who is brand new to the Air Force, just moved overseas, doesn't have any friends, and just wants to tell someone about their day. So you do have this full spectrum of the human experience and you have that opportunity again to, to join them on that journey, to, to be their chaplain, to be their friend, to be their supporter, to be the person that cheerleads them on. And I think that, I think that is the sacred part of my job, um, to have that opportunity, to have this window in, into what, what's happening, what's going on for them. Um, and then a third of my job is other uh you know more like desk job administration you know we have to be up on all of our um computer-based trainings air force trainings um a chaplain sits on many different committees the air force also loves you know groups to get together and so um you know you get to sit on these different groups and and, and some of them are awesome some of them are less awesome. And uh, so like one that I'm a part of the community action team, it is all of the helping agencies on base and we make sure that we're all on the same page. Um, so is anyone having a cool event that they need more people for? Is anyone noticing an uptick in, in this sort of a problem on base? And so it's a way to make sure that we're all on the same page caring, caring for these people because, you know, these members are we have a couple thousand um, Air Force members that are here and, and their families. And um, it's, it's hard. It's hard moving overseas and living away from your family. You know, like I felt that when we moved to Misawa. That was our first time not spending Christmas with our parents because we were in a different country or our first time experiencing extreme culture shock or, um, you know, these different facets that happen the time change, you know, not having a normal time to call your family. And so all there is all of what's normal in life and it's ups and downs. And then there's everything extra because you're in a foreign country. And so it is really exciting to have a firsthand opportunity to serve those people and to love on those people. And the, um, Air Force mission statement for the Chaplain Corps is to care for airmen more than anyone thinks possible. And I think that's really a tribute to the work that we do, loving them, you know, just pouring out into that and to really show them that they are seen, that they're cared for, and that you as the chaplain will show up for them. Awesome. Yeah, and I think for me, just hearing about the chaplaincy of just um, the thing that one of the things that struck me was you're talking about the relationship building um, and then also the communication and how in that hierarchy and that chain of command system that you are this the safest person for someone to come talk to because there's not going to be there's just total freedom and confidentiality and someone to share it within that system where there won't be um, consequences to that. So someone can really process and share where they're at and you can meet them there. And I think that that just sounds like an incredible opportunity to be there for people in that specific way. Um, do you do you feel any, um, you've got multiple vocations and one is like as an Episcopal ordained person and a an military member. Um, what's that like? Because um, sometimes our vocations can pull us in different directions or overlap in complementary or conflicting ways? Um, you know what I, I think what I miss the most about my vocation as an Episcopal priest is the sacraments. Um, we don't have an Episcopal service here and um, you know they do communion once a month and then you know I probably only end up doing communion very rarely because it depends on if you're on the schedule for that month or not. And, um, you know, there aren't a lot of Episcopalians that want to be baptized here or, you know, there, so there are, 
these things and and I think it's the I think it's the sacraments that I miss the most and I think that is something um one thing about COVID I I do think there are a few things about this crazy pandemic life that we're living that that has been good for my heart but one of them is the opportunity to watch Episcopal services online um and because I I do I miss it you know, our Sunday services are very ecumenical and because we don't have a lot of chaplains and to create a, a service for every every chaplain that exists on a base, it's just not, um, it's not feasible. Right. And it's also, it's not necessarily needed, you know? I, I know of one other Episcopalian on this base and they don't necessarily need that. That's not necessarily what they need from me. And so I think that has been a blessing to me during COVID, the opportunity to watch Episcopal, like true Episcopal services that are good for my soul. And so I think it's the sacraments. It's the sacraments that, that I really miss most. There has been one facet I, I did share that, you know, I've, I've done youth ministry before and, and I was recently thinking that I, I do miss youth ministry. You know, they're, they're filled with extra spunk, extra questions. They're, they're not quiet about their thoughts. And there, there are some real elements to that that I miss. But recently I actually had the opportunity to start volunteering with our civil air patrol unit on base, um, which is kind of like JR. ROTC, but a little different. And um, so it's been my, I have gotten that. Now I do have a youth group sort of thing that I get to visit um, twice a month. And so that that has been a really fun opportunity where I, I was missing it. But now now I have found something that kind of fits that, that vocation. Wow. That's cool. Jackie, um, just a couple uh, kind of questions as we end, but um, is there anything else about vocation that's just comes to mind that you feel compelled to share. Not that there has to be any, but anything um, you think would be helpful to pass along? You know, I think there's this element that we do, we worry that we, we missed our time, we missed our thing. Um, and I just, and I, and I think that people, people have thought that, you know, we know lots of military families that have known Scott and I and known um, that you know, he's been, he's been in and been active duty for, for a hot minute more than me, but you know, is there, is there regret that I didn't start this sooner? Um, and I, and I think that answer is no, you know, I think that this came to us at the time when it was supposed to come to us. And, and I think that we listened to God's call when we were supposed to listen to God's call. And, you know, I think there's really an element of, we we did do it you know when god wanted us to do it and when god said it before us and so i do think there's there's a fear of missing missing your call missing your vocation or it being too late but i think that that's just not true you know and you know we have a wonderful chaplain at our base who um, had been out of the Marine Corps for 20 years um, and become a priest separately and then was, was living his life in Germany um, when he got attached to the base. And I think, you, you know, like that, that was his time. That was his time to be a chaplain. And also vocations that don't, that don't result in a, in a caller, I think are important. And I do think the Episcopal Church does a great job of supporting clergy and supporting people that want to be ordained uh, in discernment. But I do think as a whole, we don't do the best of discerning vocations with our with our lay people. And I and I think that's a cool part of my counseling job because none of these people want to be uh, chaplains in the Air Force, um, but they, they want to be whole and they, they want their hearts to be full. And so what, what does that look like? You know, and, and I get to journey that with them, but I think we as a whole, as the Episcopal Church, need to be willing to enter more into that conversation of vocation with lay people and with where, where, they, where their soul is being fed and where their heart is full and where God is calling them in the midst of their life. Yeah, that's awesome. And yeah, it's kind of, I found myself going through the discernment process. And so 
um, like we said, it's a pretty in-depth thing and people, I was telling you in my process, there was a 360 degree assessment where people I'd asked anonymously filled out these surveys about different aspects of me, my character, all kinds of different things. And, um, but then there's just a lot of care given to me, like meeting with the priest for like a year and then talking to my vestry and then the bishop and all these committees along the way where they really helping you learn who you are and identify gifts and callings. And then I was thinking, man, we should have this for everybody in the Episcopal church because each of us has a calling. And um, I know it's a more formalized thing for the priesthood, but that's why I'm glad like we're hearing your story and doing this class here at St. John's because it's, Typically, uh, sometimes vocation is just then thought of like in the religious sphere or like a call to monasticism to be a monk or a nun or a priest or a deacon or something. But we all have callings in our lives and how do we honor those? And I think hearing your story too, of just trying them out and uh, not feeling like you're gonna miss the boat and just that openness is helpful. Um, I think the other thing too is just it's interesting hearing about your youth group experience and how you really found that joy of being with people in that moment um, and being there for them. And this Air Force chaplaincy is totally unexpected. You couldn't have imagined it back then, but it seems so very aligned in a lot of different ways with what drives you and what gives you a lot of fulfillment and what you have giftings for and like what you're doing now. So like looking back, you can kind of see how it makes sense for where you're at now and it kind of all belongs. Um, so I think that that's great. Um, Jackie, uh, where could people go to learn more about your work or even support it or the work of Air Force chaplains or chaplains in general? Um, well, on Facebook, there's uh, Episcopal Federal Ministries. And that is, um, it's not a diocese, but that is the group um, set aside by the Episcopal Church to support military chaplains and federal ministries. Um, so people who minister to prisons or or VA hospitals, any kind of hospital, um, but also military chaplains. And we have a bishop, Bishop Wright, and um, he cares for us all across the world. And he, he's got a lot of people across the world. Um, and so, th so that's a cool thing. They highlight um, a lot of people where they are and what they're up to. Uh, and also there's a wonderful podcast um, that actually was important in, in my discernment in figuring out the Chaplain Corps. Um, it is the Air Force Chaplain Corps podcast, uh, and it's it's called that Air Force Chaplain Corps, and it's on iTunes. And they, what I what I loved about the podcast is that they really highlight the different facets of both Air Force chaplaincy and also Air Force culture. Um, one of the when I fell in love with them, they were actually doing a series on toxic leadership and toxic followership. Um, which I, I, is an interesting dynamic and we do experience both in the Air Force and in the church. And uh, I think that they really talk about applicable things that are, that are happening in the Air Force and in the chaplain court. Wow, that's awesome. Cool. Yeah, I've heard of toxic leadership, but not toxic followership. That's really interesting. That's cool. Um, well, awesome. Well, Jackie, really appreciate you sharing your life and your journey and your insights with us. And um, we're glad to have you and many Thanks. blessings on the work you continue to do um, on behalf of airmen and as a representative of the church. So thank you so much and uh, great talking with you. Yeah, hope to see you guys soon, maybe. Yeah, we'll, we'll see. see. <laughs> All right, thanks Jackie, talk to you later. So um, any thoughts or questions or reactions to kind of Jackie's thoughts or experience there? Um, like I said, it's just more of a conversation and learning about different people's journey with that, but any thoughts there? Uh, I'll say one thing, Jamie, I've said this before. <clears throat> I really, really appreciate how the Episcopal Church takes uh, postulates through the discernment process to determine whether ministry is a good fit. Um, what I saw when I was on the standing committee were some really vetted candidates coming through that we were interviewing and I 
really appreciated this, how steeped they were in the church and the church in them. Um, so anyway, it, it, not everybody's cut out for it. And I think the Commission on Ministry calls some folks, so to speak, not a very good term. I don't know what the statistics on that are, but <laughs> her description of what she went through and being open to being rejected, so to speak, uh, was very, very healthy and gives me a lot of confidence in the future of the church. Awesome, Jamie. And so there's a commission on ministry that's kind of a body that helps that process. And you were on the standing commission, which is kind of uh, at the standing committee, which is like the final yes or no to that process. Is that, is that my correct understanding there? That's right. We, we get to see the work product fruition. We're the last step before the bishop gives his final say on it. But yeah, we, we got to see, we interviewed them throughout the course of the three years that they were in seminary. So we got the benefit of their history. Hmm. That's awesome. Well, thanks for doing that. That's a lot of time and investment there and that's well spent. Yeah, a lot more investment on their part. <laughs> <laughs> Rose, I, I think you have a question. I think you've frozen for a second though. Let's see, can we hear you? Rosa, it's frozen. I don't think we're hearing you right now, but you have, it looks like you have a very important point or question to make, but uh, maybe we'll be able to hear it later. Um, any of the remaining folks have anything to add? Okay, well, um, thanks for joining tonight. That was uh, the Reverend Jackie Pippin. She mentioned a book called Searching for Sundays by Rachel Held Evans. That's a book that John has mentioned a couple times since he's been here as our rector. So um, I'd recommend that book to you. And then Leaning In, I haven't read um, yet, but that was another book that Jackie recommended. <laughs> and uh, so, yes, thank you for joining. Next week we'll have um, the Rev. Uh, Molly Short join. She'll be, she's a school chaplain and we'll hear about her journey. So thank you everybody. Hope you have a good thank night. You, Enjoyed seeing thank you all. Thank you. Good night.